I also want to thank the, the Prescott Library and Katie. So um, I've never been to this library, but I've done some research at the Charlotte Hall Museum uh, for this book. So I really like Prescott. Uh, and then uh, just a few more thank yous. Uh, I'd like to thank the Wallapai uh, community, the Wallapai Nation, for suffering me over the past 13 or 14 years. I went to Arizona State University for my PhD and it was only about three and a half, four hours away. I was able to go up there uh, pretty frequently, perhaps too frequently for them, uh, wondering why is this guy coming back, but they never told me to leave, so uh, I think that was, that, that was uh, nice. Nice relationship. Also, the Wallapai Department of Cultural Resources. They're the group that I worked with. Uh, that was sort of a home base for me when I worked in their offices at the Wide Trailer and shimmied quite a bit in the wind. And every now and then, the electricity went out. So that was interesting when I was trying to work on my computer. Uh, but regardless of the facilities, the very uh, a very warm community and, and very supportive. And in particular, a couple people. Loretta Jackson, who now oversees the, the Cultural Resources Department. Lucille Wadahamaji, uh, who invited me up to Wallapai for the first time in 1998. And then a couple other folks. Uh, Wilfred Wakaname, uh, who also helped me and supported me with my work. And then a gentleman named Monza Honga, who passed away a few years ago. And uh, he's a wonderful friend and a, and a very good mentor. And it's to whom that the is to him that the book is primarily dedicated to. So I think that's enough in the way of, of introductions. Um, the talk today I thought would be clever, the long walk to the skywalk. Uh, we'll talk about the skywalk for sure. There's no shortage of opinions on the skywalk. So we'll, 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 we'll try to deal with that towards the end. Um, yeah, definitely. The book came out in 2010, very happily. It was, it was a long process starting around 1997, 19, 1998 with the University of Arizona Press. And if you should choose to purchase it online from U of A Press, particularly, profits from the book go to a college stipend for uh, qualified kids who are going to school. It's not going to make a million dollars, but it'll, it'll provide basically kind of like a book stipend for some students going to, going to school. So I, I don't really, I don't get any of that, the problem. So in case you don't know, <coughs> the Wallapai Reservation is the horseshoe shaped reservation in the top left corner of Arizona. Uh, you may not know this, but roughly 25, 20, 26% of all Arizona is Indian Reservation. That's probably the largest percentage in the United States. Some of the main themes of the book, uh, and I'm not going to go through every single point, uh, just cover some of the main things, is I was mainly interested in how Wallapais had survived these radical changes to their life since non-natives uh, emerged in their homeland around the 1850s, 1860s. And so I tried to focus on some basic themes about Western expansion, loss of their land, and their tense relationship with the Bureau of Indian Affairs which is under the Department of Interior. I was interested in these ideas of identity, a community that started out with about 12 or 13 bands by the mid to late 20th century was considering itself a nation, a small nation, but, but a nation. I was very interested in a nation of things, trying to have some balance between issues such as colonialism and racism, but also their persistence and adaptation so, so their survival in the midst of overwhelming, overwhelming odds. And in general, some things down here regarding economics, politics, uh, economic development, government, things, things like that are some of the main, the main themes of the book. Just very briefly about the methods, a lot of people ask me uh, about this because there are tremendous wealth of sources on the national level. The Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of Interior and the Department of War had amassed literally hundreds of thousands of documents for the wall of pie alone. And we're talking about 200 to 250 bankers boxes, only covering a 60 year time period. 
and that does not include tribal records themselves. So starting in the 1930s, going up to the present, when the Wallapais had a very formal uh, tribal government, I looked for their minutes, the meetings of the tribal government minutes and resolutions, and then also looked at a newsletter, essentially a newspaper, that they started in the 1950s. So the book is heavily archival, archival and then supplemented with participant observation, uh, which they call just hanging out. <laughs> so you're up here to hang out again. Yes. Um, and the number of interviews that I conducted, probably about 12 formal interviews that I conducted, dozens of sort of off the cuff, on the back of a pickup truck, on a horse, at a powwow, sort of quote, interviews. Now these are not going to pass any formal university muster, uh, but they were really wonderful sources of, of information. And then the, the other question that comes up a lot in relations with Native people and academics is reciprocity. So a lot of Native, there's a lot of academics that kind of, they kind of show up in reservations and take information and sort of disappear. And so what I've done is I provide some reciprocity in terms of the, ar the archival documents that I found, made extra copies and gave those back to the tribe. Then I worked for the tribe for many years. I tried to volunteer for them and said I'd do it pro bono, but they said, we don't want charity. <laughs> uh, we don't want charity, so they paid me. So um, this is an issue of ethics, but it's also an issue of, of just basically good transparency. And also just being nice. A lot of times academics come up with these big words for different things, and it's really kind of simple. It comes down to being nice, being open, being honest, different perspectives to things, et cetera, et cetera. So a little bit about the origins. Uh, Native peoples uh, across the world have origin stories, much like um, other religions have types of origin stories. <laughs> so we talk about myths for Indians, but we sometimes don't talk about myths for other religious traditions. Uh, Wallapais, their origin story places them emerging at Spirit Mountain along the Colorado River. Spirit Mountain's right on the, the west side of Colorado River. I'll show you a map in particular. Their origin story shows them expanding at this point along the Colorado River across the southwest. And it also explains their relationships with other Native peoples across the southwest. And in their origin story, they explain the Navajo, the Hopi, Paiutes, Chemehuevi, et cetera, et cetera. A little bit about the language. Uh, they're part of the human language group, and particularly the Pi branch. So you can kind of see down here, Pi. So groups like the Yavapai, okay, speak pretty much the same language, okay. There's a lot of similarities between the Yavapai and some of the Mojaves, the Chemehuevis, okay. And then this goes all the way down, whoop, this is really sensitive. This goes all the way down into Mexico. So the indigenous language that these peoples speak crosses the international boundary. And I had a really fascinating moment in 1997 when I went with some Wallapais to a language institute, a uh, language conference down in Yuma. And there were folks who were Pai Pai and Kokopa and Kachan on the south side of the border. And they spoke their native language in Spanish. Wallapais spoke their native language in English. So they were able to speak to each other via their native language across the international boundary. It was really pretty interesting. And then right up here above Needles is, is more or less the approximate location of Spirit Mountain. And a number of native people place their emergence there. So a little bit about what I call pre-conquest or pre-colonial history. I, I usually don't use the term prehistory because I don't think that there's a point before history. Um, well, perhaps there is in a big existential religious way. Uh, but prehistory, uh, what people mean is, is before the written language. And Native peoples have very strong uh, oral traditions. And in fact, a lot of Native people have written languages, actually. So there's some misnomers when we use the term prehistory. So around six million acres and a very variable uh, uh, environment that they lived in, high windswept Colorado Plateau, uh, down into the Colorado River and, and the canyons, okay? 
so very arid. They practiced a seasonal migration to specific places. This is not what we popularly know as nomadism. Uh, Native people didn't wander. They had very specific places that they went to during specific points in the season. It looked like wandering when non-natives came into the area. So this helped facilitate this possession. So there were many cases when some non-natives came into a particular uh, uh, area, a, a band of wild pies had left during one season and the settlers came in and then wild pies came back. And that created not a little bit of tension. <laughs> but this contributed to this idea that, that Native people wandered. Socially, politically, uh, they're very decentralized. There's not a hierarchical form of, of government or society. They're primarily organized along 12 or 13 bands, and bands being groups of extended families between 20 and 200. Okay? There, one of the reasons why I say 12 to 13 is that the Havasupai are a band. So I'll explain that in a second. So the Havasupai are a band of the Northeastern Pai. So in addition to being decentralized, no, there was no one leader that had coercive force. No one leader had the right to speak to any, had the right to speak for everybody. And this drove the Department of Interior, territorial officials, the military, it drove them crazy. <laughs> Because it looked like they were uh, factionalized, it looked like they couldn't agree, but in fact, this just wasn't how they did things. They did things, things through consensus, through discussion, through debate, but there was no single coercive force. And then just real quickly, I know this is a lot of stuff up here, but uh, it kind of gives you a sense of the different names of the different bands. And so some um, anthropologists, in particular Dobbins and Euler, have organized the 13 or so bands into what they call sub-tribes. I'm a little skeptical of that organization, as are some wallopies, but nonetheless, uh, it gives you sort of a, a sense of the regional variation. So the, the middle, middle mountain people, and you see the names of people associated with places. So places, mountains, and springs are integral to the names and identities of, of Native people. But if you focus on the red up here, Amat Wala Aha, this is a name of one band that the military and the territorial officials came into contact a lot with. And this is the origins of the name Walpi. So the name Walpi is an ang is a sort of an, ang an English version of Amat Wallapa'a, and that's how the, the folks spell Wallapai for most of the 20th century. It's, it's spelled with an H-U-A, but that's how it's spelled for most of the 20th century. So the name Wallapai comes from the misidentification of all these people from a lot of interaction with one band. And then another, another group of, of these, quote, sub-tribes, and again you see the, the names of topographical characteristics tied to the names of people. And then down in the blue, this is supposed to be, I was trying to be clever, uh, with a blue-green color here, but it's probably a little hard to see in the back. The Havasupai, this is the Havasupai. This is the Havasupai. And although there's a separate reservation for them, this is essentially all the same people. This is really just the same people. It's like if you had a, if you had a cousin, that got separated, and then everybody thought it was a radically different family. But it's, they're just, it's just not, it's essentially the same people. And, and this is very difficult to see, but it gives you a sense of, with all the different hash marks and the shadings, of the breakdown of bands across Northwest Arizona. Okay, so right around in here, around Kingman, that's the Amatwalapa'a. And Kingman became the seat of the county. And so this is one of the reasons why the name Wallapai became projected across all the bands. This is the place that non-natives had the most interaction with these people. And then 
way up here.